Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm pleased to introduce to you Adrian Manessis from Myosh and Josh Bryant, uh, General Manager with Mitchell Services. We're here today to have a conversation around how to use innovative fatal risk management technology. Um, this is ahead of an executive briefing which is taking place at IMARC. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome these two gents to uh, to have a conversation. Welcome, guys. How are you both? Good, thank you. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Absolutely, great to have you here. Look, I'll kick off with a couple of questions, and then uh, we'll see where the conversation goes. But really, for a lot of people, you know, what is critical control management in a mining context, and how has it evolved over the past five years? For yeah. us, uh, critical risk management, it's it's basically a, a practice to manage risks uh, in our high hazard operations by ensuring that the mm. controls that are in place are effective, that are the ones that are crucial for preventing or minimising those catastrophic incidents, which include mostly fatalities, right? So critical risk management or CCM really looks at us, look at what are those unwanted events, the material unwanted events, so those, those events that could cause a fatality or multiple fatalities, and works to ensure that the controls in place to prevent these events or to mitigate the consequences. So that's probably the, the key of what critical risk man management's about. It's not about your slip, strips and falls or your hands and fingers injuries. This is about high consequence um, events and preventing those. So Adrian, do you want to talk about the evolution over the last five years? Yeah, absolutely. So there's been better guidance over the last five to 10 years through the ICMM, which is the International Council on Mining and Metals um, uh, Organisation, which has provided some good guidance on how to implement um, critical control management. So what that's allowed, to, what, what that's made um, possible is for not just larger organisations and large mining companies to adopt CCM, it's also allowed smaller organisations to adopt it as well, because the guidance is there. It's not um, tied up in just professionals that that know how to use it. And um, the average person can actually now go and look at this information, actually implement it based on um, relatively easy to understand um, information that's readily available. So what were the principal drivers of, of that change that, that you were talking about? Um, I, I guess the, the principal drivers um, are, are the fact that there's there's too many serious incidents happening within the mining industry. So there's still multiple fatalities. There's um, there's legislative changes. So the regulators are getting tougher on organisations that don't understand their critical controls and their critical risks. Um, and there's a... Um, so in some jurisdictions, it's built into legislation. So recently in Queensland, um, they're implementing legislation to basically say you have to manage your critical risks. Um, there'll be probably better wording that Josh can provide there. Um, there's evidence that it works. So when you implement critical control management effectively, it will reduce um, and minimise fatalities. Um, so it does work. It's there, We ha actually have the solution available um, and the fact that it works means that people can implement it. It also improves efficiencies. Look, to me, I, I think there's the ESG component as well, Adrian, where it, it, this is ethically the right thing to do, right? We need to create safer workplaces and, you know, stakeholders, shareholders and the wider community are expecting more and more businesses to create a safe working environment, a psychologically safe work environment, but also an environment that's free from fatalities. And that's what critical risk management is all about. It's, a, it's actually driven by community. It's driven by our shareholders, driven by owners, but it's also the wider public wants to see mining as a, as a safe place to work. That's what's really driving that change as well. And how has technology evolved as a, as a, as a factor and as an enabler, not just with respect to size of companies, but in other, other aspects? Yeah, look, Kim, for me, with the technology, like it just seems that, you know, there's one system that does this and there's one system that does that and then there's one system and then you've got to build an API so they all talk and then you actually just even though the technology is great, you actually just complete this, you know, complexity in your systems and where things can fall over. So 
Um, for us working with MIOSH, that's where we've looked for this, I guess this only one solution when it comes to critical risk management. Because what we what we find even with our clients, and it's no offense to our clients, but we find their systems become quite bloated because you know yeah. they've got this system that does all this and the system does that does all that. But I mean, just to just to finish, one big point that Adrian makes is that configurability that I can go in there and I don't need to be a developer. Like I can actually use this software and configure it myself, look at my own critical controls, look at where I need to change my verifications. And I don't necessarily need to involve uh, MIOSH. So that's probably one big thing that's evolving as well is that it's actually making it simpler for us folks, the the, the ones who are, are basically in, implementing these systems involving frontline workers. It's making it easy for us to maintain control without having to use the vendor all the time to make any changes. Kim, I, I guess summarising that, we actually are keeping risk alive. Like it's, it's actually a live thing. It's not something that sits on the shelf or sits over here. We're actually keeping risk alive in our organisation. Well, I Absolutely. think that, that adds and to the fact that it's a sustainable process and that's a really big thing. So a lot of organisations put a lot of effort into trying to get CCM going, but it's not sustainable because of all the disconnects between the software and the inability to do that continuous improvement. Um, so talking about the MIOSH software and the, and the um, service business, how reflective of the change in the key markets, um, especially relating to mining, um, ha ha have you been able to make th those changes over the years, Adrian? Um, back then, what we did is we, we were actually one of the first ones to look at the software as a service, and we were able to decrease the cost of the software so small um, organisations could also adopt the software. Um, but back then, the software is still relatively rudimentary. It still was more trying to reproduce what you did on paper to improve efficiencies as opposed to have real change and real um, um, reductions in injuries. So it was still doing some really important things. So it was investigating incidents and was making sure that you had learnings from those incidents, you had actions in place, you had increased accountability and so forth. So those things were there back in 2002. Um, and as time's gone on, where we're, where, what we're looking at is rather than just reproducing paper where, and focusing on lag indicators, um, we're looking at configurable and automated solutions. So you take out the human error, the software handles it to make sure that um, things are, that it's reported on and things occur. There's automation that occurs so people don't have to, if they are doing an inspection or a verification, all the things that need to happen when something fails happens without relying on humans to be able to say, okay, I now have to contact this person, I now have to do that, I now have to report it here. So it's moved from just reproducing paper and reporting right through to automating and allowing the control back to the business owners who understand the problems. So in the past, we've had to understand what customers want. Now customers can actually now through no code, our no code solution, be able to maintain that themselves without the, the disconnect that often occurs between us trying to interpret what someone wants and they knowing what they want. That's a really key step then to integrate technology with culture change within organisations, because it's only when you understand organisations that you're actually going to be able to affect that that change, as it were. And I just, I just want to stress that again, Kim, that um, they didn't try to fit their solution into our problems. They actually really tried to understand like, what is the problem you're trying to solve here, Josh? Yeah. And it really was that lack of integration between software, having to run things in Excel spreadsheets, and then, oh, then I need an API to talk to this thing. So that's how it was look, looking at the effective integration is to go, well, what systems do you currently use? That's great, but what's the problem that you've got it all in for? So, yeah. you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Um, the other one is really thinking about the end user, all right? I know none of us are, are, you know, especially me, I'm not a spring chicken, but we work with the TikTok generation now, okay? So how do, they're, they're using technology every day. They're on, you know, social media, they're on, you know, uh, video calls, et cetera. So how does the technology look what they 
you know, live, breathe and feel and live with every single day. Like if it doesn't look like that and it looks antiquated and old, they're not yeah. going to use it. So that's how we had to integrate technology as well. So what what we wanted to do is make sure that the solution, so the Maya solution that we took actually fit our needs was something that the frontline could actually use and were familiar with and, and actually use their input into what it looked like and what it felt like. Uh, and again, make it less of like a campaign or an implementation or something like that, but make it just part of the, the way that we do work. That's how we implement it. It's just like, hey, you can use your phone to do the inspections. Hey, can you do, use your phone to do critical risk verifications? You can do reporting. Hey, we can do operational learning straight from your phone. Um, and one big thing, I guess, from a technological point of view is that we actually work in underground mines and remote, and remote workplaces as well. So the solution we needed was that we had to be able to use it offline and then when it came into service we could sync that data um yeah. so that was a that was really important to us as well as let that technology fit how we do work not yeah. oh the technology can only do these things so that's your limitation and the approach that i was really impressed with what josh um is doing is the involvement of the workers they're involved at every single point so it wasn't just we're telling you what to do. It's we want your feedback. Um, and, and that to me gave great confidence. Like we like to partner with organisations and understand the problems, but we also like to partner with organisations that A, are doing things for the right reasons, not just to be compliant. Um, we also like to partner with organisations that have uh, an approach that we believe will be successful. Um, and then that way we can then we know that what we're going to do is really going to help those organisations. Mm -hmm. We made um, critical control verifications and CCM in general as part of their everyday work. We didn't increase, well, Josh didn't increase really because he's, just, he's the one who implemented it. Josh didn't increase the amount of work that the end user had to do. They were already doing inspections out in the field. All he did was make it so those inspections were tailored to critical control management and they were doing what was important rather than a scattergun approach, which many organisations do. They're trying to fix every single safety problem in an inspection as opposed to focusing on what's important and what do we really need to do and what do we really need to pay attention to. And by doing that, the workers not only had the involvement, they could actually see that it was going to work and that it is in fact working. Um, so I think that's a major aspect to the cultural change is that involvement of the workers and um, not um, loading them with too much work, ex additional work, allowing them to get to do their work and let the technology automate many of the processes. Um, what were the factors that earned Mitchell the safety team of the year recognition? Uh -huh. A bit, little bit embarrassing, but yeah. Um, thank, thank you. So yeah, we were recognised by the Australian Institute of Health and Safety as the the safety team of the year in 2023. Look, there's a there's a couple of things uh, at play here. So one thing is the the nuclear industry in the 90s and early 2000s implemented what was called human and organisational performance, uh, and they are a set of principles that you can apply work through, particularly for leaders. Um, so we implemented what was called human and organisational performance, or HOP. But as part of that, one of the one of the key principles is HOP is that leaders' response matters. And so what we found is that uh, when we were finding critical control failures in the field, uh, they weren't as transparent as we needed to. So we worked with MIOSH really closely with them to try and bring the information from the front line up through the organisation, remove this frozen middle and make this information like accessible to everyone. So we've created uh, these dashboards that every single site supervisor can look at. They can see how many critical control verifications have been done, where the fails have been done. So they, they can actually see and have transparency on the brittleness in the systems at their work site, but it also lets the organisation and the board look at well, where are we most fragile in our organisation. So um, we started to really like show that in industry that it's okay to receive bad news and talk about where you can improve, uh, particularly when it came to critical risk management, right? Like this is showing where you've got holes where you, there could be a fatality here. You need to take ownership. And if it's a systemic issue, 
um, like it could be the, the, you know, it's the system of work, the leaders in the organization own that and need to make that change. So um, by doing this work, by doing critical control management, we didn't involve any external consultants either, Kimberly. We did it ourselves and we used the ICMM guides, which are a free resource. And we just worked our way through it and we brought Myosh along for the journey to go, okay, yep, let's under this is our understanding of critical risk. The software met the problem. So they were working with that. We were working with them being transparent, going, hey, this is where it's working for our people in the field. So again, lots and lots of collaboration and, and we showed that. So it was never about making the Myosh critical risk solution more marketable. Um, it was actually making it more effective in controlling um, and reducing fatalities. And what we've done with that knowledge, Kimberly, is we've tried to share it with as many people as we possibly can. So in terms of technology improving critical critical controls and enhancing communication, um, contributing to better risk management and injury outcomes, have you got any examples of how that enhanced communication was better, how it contributed to improved risk management? Have you got examples of where that's worked more effectively? Uh, Adrian, do you want to hand over to you, mate? Yeah, sure. I guess it's the um, the transparency of the control failures and the and but, uh, the accessibility of the data via the dashboards, so yeah. everyone can see this information. Everyone can see what the failures are. They're not trying to hide things. So in the past, if there's a failure, that'd usually be, oh, I'm going to get into trouble, or someone's going to get into trouble if I report this. Um, where there's a culture of um, and a system in place that can record this information with a no blame type. Um, philosophy, um, you've got the you've, you've got that transparency. Um, people can look at that information and they can take action on that information in real time. And I think that's uh, Adrian. Can I give can I give Kim a, a specific example? So yeah, that's all right. Yeah, so Absolutely. in the underground environment, um, Kim, we we try. I mean, we've got things that spin, right? We're a drilling company, so we we basically drill holes in the ground. Um, so we put lasers in place that basically will cut the machine off if someone walks through them. But what we were finding with the critical risk module within MIOSH is that when they were doing the verifications, we found a lot of fails with our lasers and we, we were trying to understand why. And what it was is that the way that the drill sites were designed by clients could only fit the drilling rig in a certain position and that didn't allow the effective placement of the lasers and what we found is through the critical control verification process and the ability to record an observation, it's not just a, it failed. You've got to go, it failed and give an observation and give what action. What it, what it actually taught us is that we could modify the, the design of where our drill rigs had to go in, but also change the way that our lasers were placed and the types of lasers. So it gave us transparency on, hey, we're not just having a fail underground at this spot. We're actually having it in this underground mine and this underground mine. And as a result here, they have to do a, a job safety analysis every time that they set the lasers up and people are able to like reach over and bypass lasers. So it actually taught us that our controls maybe aren't effective as we thought they are just because they're in a checklist um, and that we're able to explore that, you know, that systemic problem that we've got with laser placement and work with clients in the actual changing the design of where our drilling rigs were placed underground. So I guess my, my last question, what's next? What are the next steps? Where is further improvement going to come from? What's what's next for you guys? Adrian, it must be your turn to start yeah, off. Yeah, it is, Adrian. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm really super excited about what's happening next. I know people, you, you hear that a lot, but I really am. I, I um, live and breathe this stuff. Um, we're doing some things now. We've built an AI team, um, an artificial intelligence team within our organisation to ensure that AI can be used effectively to help organizations not replace what people do, but to help them make better decisions and to be able to implement this. So where artificial intelligence is helping is it's helping, typically when you're doing a, 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 a looking at an unwanted event, a material unwanted event, you go through a brainstorming exercise where you build a bow tie, you identify what are the events you identify what is a critical, what are the controls. So you build that bow tie diagram out. So our latest iterations, which we'll be releasing very shortly, in fact, I've been very happily playing with it and seeing the amazing of the results, is our software can actually help build the bow tie. 
And that shouldn't replace the very valuable process of the brainstorming that happens within the team. But what it does is it gets people started and it allows people to see, okay, well, these are the causes, these are the controls that it's suggesting. And it then, it's then allowing the team to say, well, it didn't include this one, or maybe we that one doesn't apply and we can change it to something else. But it takes that bit out of it where they don't know where to start and it is producing some incredible results. Now, but what is also really exciting in there is it will look at your existing bow ties and then come up with um, suggestions on how you could be improving the controls, adding additional controls, identifying whether something's critical or not, where you might have you might have an administrative control that you've deemed as critical where it shouldn't be um, because it's an administrative control or it doesn't meet the criteria um, for a critical control. So through machine learning, through training models, we can tell it what is the definition of a critical control. So I guess from my side, you know, it, it's devastating, but two of our clients on the last two days have had fatalities at their operations. And I mean, they're sophisticated clients that have got, you know, big systems controls, but there are there are other clients who have got greater exposures than these large mining companies. And just to have the technology, the information, the use of AI to like, you know, get you off the starting line, you're already off the blocks, you're in the pool, like you're already, you know, you're, you're nearly down the lane. So just to have that that help without having to put extra resources on, without necessarily having to involve external consultants. That's what that's what's exciting me is that more free flow of information and getting more and more businesses focusing on the things that matter the most is fatality risk, this high energy control, um, rather than really focus on these minor injuries and telling people like, you know, you need to work better and love your family more. Like this is technology that will help you move your business towards more that leading indications where's the capacity in your business to handle failure and control those energies that can kill people so for me the technology is just making critical risk management more and more accessible guided by you know councils like the international mining and, and metallurgy um, metals um, you know mining is going to get better it's going to get stronger and it's going to get safer I think um, just one one more thing onto that um, on the AI front is it's also giving you additional insights into the data that you're collecting. So not only is it helping you identify the process and build your critical controls, um, suggest how you can improve things, but it will also look at the data, the massive amount of data that you collect and then suggest what are the trends what are the things that are going to be happening that could be happening in the business? What are the things that you should be focusing on? Um, so using that technology to then predict the future. So you've already got when you're doing a verification and it fails, it's not the end of the world because the event hasn't happened. But you may have failures over a period of time that might indicate that you are about to have a major incident with a fatality. So the idea is to prevent that from happening. And that Look Thank you both. I, I love the, the the forward thinking notion that, you know, mining's going to get stronger, it's going to get better, it's going to get safer. Um, and I think in the hands of uh, Mayash and uh, Mitchell Services, it certainly should. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for your time and uh, see you at IMARC, um, 29th to the 31st of October um, at the ICC in Sydney, where you are running an executive briefing on how to use innovative fate, fatal risk management technology. So thank you again for your time, guys. Lovely to meet you both and look forward to seeing you at IMARC.